broken actually is something very near and dear to me and it kind of, um, it infuses my work, it infuses my life and philosophically I've sought to understand what it even means. Um, so it was kind of uh, synchronistic that I was able to speak on this topic because it's, uh, it's a big part of my work and it's become more so as time has gone on. Um, so I'm going to give a little bit of a kind of philosophical background about um, the idea of flaws and broken and how it came to be a part of my work. Look at some images of my work. I will go off on various tangents and you guys can try to rein me back in and uh, we'll try to get out of this without any injuries. Um, some of you, maybe all of you, might be familiar with something called kintsugi, which is a uh, Japanese art of repairing uh, things that are broken with gold. It's a really beautiful metaphor for life in that things that appear flawed or we would discard, the art of Kintsugi actually draws attention to it by filling, it, filling the cracks with gold and making it the most beautiful part of the piece. From an early uh, start in painting, I, uh, I started to look at the surface of my paintings as flesh. I'd, consider myself a figurative painter primarily, um, dealing, trying to understand what it is to be human, um, what it is to grow and age and explore. And the surface of the painting started to reveal themselves as flesh to me. And within that flesh are the maps of our lives. And those maps are filled with scars and wrinkles and various flaws. And I started to find these things very beautiful, and this became what the work was about. It was about the inherent beauty in this. Uh, you know, we look at something like the Nike of Samothrace or the Venus de Milo now with its broken arms and fallen heads. And they've become iconic as images because of their broken parts, probably much more so than the complete statue would have been. So as I kind of uh, explored um, this is actually a new piece. I'm going to start with a brand new piece. Um, my kind of process right now is I'm actually like creating things and then I'm actually breaking them. I'm taking them apart, deconstructing them to get to what they're supposed to be. Um, history plays a huge role in my work uh, in, in the physical history of the piece. Some pieces are five, six, seven paintings deep and kind of each painting leads me to the next one, building up this kind of history. Um, where it all began though was, I, whenever I get comfortable creating, whenever I get a pat on the back from mom or um, someone, you know, I have a good successful show or uh, make some money, it's like hang a left, break it, right? Because this comfort is the most dangerous thing to the creative process. Um, I've long believed that the known imposes constraints on creativity. So the more that we know and understand about what we do, the tighter and tighter our focus becomes and we stop exploring. I liken uh, painting to going for a walk in a forest, you know, and I'm following a path and then that path kind of dissipates and it's no longer visible. That's when it gets exciting, right? Then I go on an adventure and I don't know where I'm going. The, the journey itself is the process. Um, I think Steve actually was in a class with me, perhaps. First year at ACAD, we had an instructor named uh, Richard Halliday. I don't know if anyone's familiar with his work, but he was this amazing burly bear of a man, big beard and tousled hair and dirty face. And he had us do these drawings in, in my, uh, my memory of the experience. He had us do these drawings of our uh, living rooms, I believe. These kind of spent about a week on these charcoal renderings um, in which we put everything into it. You know, it's first year. We kind of lovingly record that sofa. And we brought him in and we put him up for our first critique. And he kind of wandered in and he reached into his pocket, got some charcoal out and he drew on your drawing kind of rubbed it with his thumb, tore a piece off, knocked it on the floor and walked over it. I'm, I do distinctly recall, you know, a couple people actually breaking down into tears and <laughs> leaving. 
And I was kind of like, what is this guy doing, right? And years later, I realized that was the most important part of my entire post-secondary career. He killed the preciousness of the object for me. It was not precious. It meant nothing. Now I've come to learn that these things that we make are kind of like the shed skin of a snake. They're what's left over. They're a marker of growth. And the key is to let go of those things so that we can move forward and make another and make another and make another. You know, there's this beautiful uh, Hindu uh, deity. It dances in the ring of fire and a create, dance of creation and destruction. And it's cyclical. It's like we create and we destroy. We create and we destroy. And when you can get into that cycle and not get trapped by the thing we make, when you can break it, you're free to make another and another and another. And this is the real beauty of creation, is that it is actually creating. So in hanging that left, so here's where you're going to start realizing I bounce all over the place. And uh, I'm kind of a strong believer in chaos theory, so there is some underlying order here if you can hang on. Um, when I hung that left, I got rid of oil paint because it was becoming comfortable. I could do things with it. I could have an idea, and it would come out roughly as I was imagining it. But the create, creation was kind of starting to lack. I was starting to produce. And I make a strong delineation between creating and producing. Very easy to produce. Once you learn how to do something, I can just keep doing this thing ad infinitum. Creating is something new. It's stepping outside of myself. It's discomfort. It's um, challenging. So I started working in something called encaustic, which is a uh, really ancient technique that the Greeks developed. Uh, they were sealing the hulls of ships, and some enterprising young Greek had the idea that if we mix pigment in with the wax, encaustic is a wax pigment, um, I could actually decorate the hulls of these ships. So encaustic literally means to burn. And that means that painting with molten wax with pigment in it, they would build up layers. Those layers are all separate layers. So they would burn in the layers, fusing all the layers together. And we actually have uh, uh, funeral portraits from the Egyptians. Uh, we have Greek pieces that were painted in this encaustic technique. And they're still in perfect condition. They haven't deteriorated at all because they're chemically inert. It's just wax with pigment suspended in it. So I kind of hung a left from oil paint. I thought, oh, what's this weird antiquated kind of technique I could explore? just to shift it up to try something different. Now what, what happens with liquid wax if ever you've spilled a candle is that the wax drips and it dries almost instantaneously. It has a very uh, low melting point for the most part and then it hits the air and it dries. So painting with liquid wax has its own inherent challenges in that I have to move my brush from this molten hot pot across a space, even if it's a couple of feet, by the time it hits the canvas, it's drying. So you get this kind of chaotic, immediate uh, painting technique that when you burn it in, it's a very, there's a sweet spot of it fusing and then melting to nothing. So in learning to do this, I got this really interesting kind of uh, space in that I was destroying most of the work I was doing. And it felt really good. It was like a, it was a real freedom there. It was like this thing that I've created, I can kill, and it becomes a new thing. As a young boy, I grew up in England, and I had the luxury of my grandparents taking me to the British Museum and the National Portrait Gallery. And I got this kind of real classical, linear kind of understanding of uh, humanity, of culture. Uh, my granddad used to show me, you know, this vessel was made. And from this vessel, we understood how to make this vessel. Then we understood how to make a spout. Then we understood da 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 da, -da and off we went. So I got this real kind of uh, chronological, linear understanding of history um, rooted in classicism. I then, you know, hit my teen years and uh, learned what a skateboard was and punk rock. And uh, I realized it's fun to kill your heroes and smash these things. And so as an adult, I have these kind of parallel paths of uh, classicism and irreverence. And it's 
smashes together and uh, I like to make pretty things and break them. So um, in this kind of dissolution of the wax, I found a new space, a new a third kind of thing started to occur. Not unlike Kintsugi, this kind of original artifact that breaks, that's reassembled to create a new thing. Um, during the wax process, the wax would drip everywhere. And it would fall on the floor, on anything that was lying around me. And uh, I started to realize these things on the floor became very beautiful, these kind of byproducts of the process. And these things started to become these substrates that I would paint on. So they had taken on their own kind of history of the process and kind of opened the door for the next piece. And this was that kind of wandering through the forest that I was starting to have the experience of. Um, I started to get a handle of the wax then. I was like, okay, now I understand how much heat. I know where I can start to break it apart. So I start freaking out because it's comfortable. And mom said, that's a nice painting. So I uh, quickly let go of that. Um, but what did happen was this kind of the substrate came out of that then, this kind of artifact, this thing. And this is now I'm back to granddad showing me these little fragments in the British Museum. I'm like, I love this kind of patina of history, this, this, uh, this object that has, it starts to take on its own life. Um, it has its own stories, its own experiences. Um, so I started to explore like uh, historical kind of uh, imagery, you know, these, these pieces were about uh, Icarus, the myth of Icarus, and um, the Battle of Britain, which occurred over Liverpool, where my family's from. Um, and I started to see these kind of parallels between like um, young boys taking flight and spitfires above the English Channel fighting the Germans. Similar to the Icarus myth, these uh, idealistic kind of flights that you know, ultimately kind of succumbed. Um, Again, the paper, I'm starting to pick it up a little bit here because I'm noticing time is ticking. But I noticed the, uh, the paper, just the, the thing started to dictate the imagery. Rather than me trying to go, I'm going to paint, you know, some flowers, I started finding scraps and seeing, okay, what is this about? Starting to trust it as opposed to me trying to project onto it. And it, it, it opened, the world just opened up because I was finding that the, the source was inside it. It already existed. I was just kind of like freeing it in a sense. Um, then I had a show a few years ago now called Astoria, which was um, based on the work of Herodotus, who was a uh, Greek historian. I don't know if anybody's familiar with his work, but... He, uh, he's kind of known as the father of history. He started recording Greek life. But he was also known as the father of lies because he was making most of it up. And I, I really enjoyed that. It was kind of that um, kicking classicism's pants again, which I always enjoy. Um, so I made these big kind of epic Greco-Roman images, and then I started throwing buckets of paint at them, not unlike you know, walking into a museum and damaging the Michelangelo sculpture. Not that I'm suggesting anyone does that, but I do enjoy it on some perverse level. I love the object, but to be free from it, I have to kill it. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's, um, I don't know. I'm currently talking to my therapist about it. We'll get through that part. <laughs> but uh, this was quite a funny one. The reason I showed it is that this is about... Uh, 12 feet by 10 feet, this painting, and I, I had it in my studio, and my wife had come in, and she's like, oh, you know, it's, I love this, it's so pretty, you know, and it's like, mom's in my ear telling me she likes my painting, and like, I literally mixed up a bucket of yellow and chucked it at it, and she actually went into the house and came back as I was about to throw it, and it's just like, what are you doing, like this self-sabotage, but it's, it's how I get to the next place is to break the shell, you know? Um, that then started to, okay, so there's images, there's things I like. I started painting these images on top of old images and scraping off those images to reveal the previous images. It's just layers and layers and trying to 
um, again, this clock that's attacking me from the background here, I, I don't really subscribe to linear time. I don't really buy into this thing. I think it's all one big illusion. Um, so I, I like the idea of taking points throughout history and collapsing them on themselves to create a picture plane. So all those kind of linear points all flatten out to create these images. Um, started ripping my paintings in half, and it wasn't enough to just throw paint at them. Now I have to tear them in half. Just getting to those fragments. Um, as a, as a, when I left art college, you know, I kind of, I realized the problem that had started is that I was learning to make pretty things. <coughs> and as a small child, one of the biggest problems we have is that we take kids and we go, okay, go make a pretty picture in school. They bring it home and we, oh, this is beautiful. We pin it up on the fridge and we covet it and we document it and we frame it. And we get very attached to those things. And it actually impedes our creative growth because we want these things. They're beautiful. Don't touch it. Don't damage it, right? And this is just what Richard Halliday was doing when he ripped the corner off my drawing and knocked it on the floor. He was freeing me from it. And so I, uh, I had this kind of dream when I left school that one day, ultimately, I could maybe be a shepherd. And I thought it would be such a beautiful existence to just be able to sit and not actually have to make anything anymore, just be content with it all. So I, maybe I'm slowly going to destroy all these things and there'll be nothing left. Um, this is a fairly recent piece. Again, you know, pretty thing, throw paint at it, and voila. Which I get is already becoming a thing I need to shake, right? Thank you for that. I just realized that moment. Um, you can all go now. <laughs> um, some recent studies of uh, butterflies, which came about um, because of this classism and history. I, uh, I was asked to make some pieces for... Um, an exhibition about fire, thematically driven by fire. So of course I sent them a bunch of butterflies and you know, and that's self-sabotage. Uh, but I got there because um, I started exploring the uh, origins of fire and its various Greco-Roman mythologies which led me to Pandora and Pandora's vessels and the Kintsugi, the broken vessel, because it wasn't actually a box, it was a vessel, but the broken vessel and uh, when it was attempted to be put back together, there was one thing remaining in it, and that thing was something called elpis. And elpis is the Greek word for hope. So I started exploring hope in this kind of journey through the forest, and elpis, and there's an elpis butterfly. And so I drew all these butterflies and sent them to the fire exhibition where they, uh, I'm sure they confusedly rejected them and hung them in the back room. I didn't go to it, but... Um, an image of Pandora, again, you know, the remnants of old paintings. Um, <coughs> it's about three or four paintings on there. Um, but each, there's elements of each painting kind of that slowly reveal themselves so that I can get to the image it's supposed to be. Um, again, you know, I, I was, that piece I showed at the beginning, or a variety, a variation on it. I was making drawings and then I'm starting to scribble on the drawings to kind of wipe them out. This is uh, kind of loosely based on Virginia Woolf, but this, you know, um, some of her writings, I'm in the mood to dissolve the sky. You know, I start this, this kind of dissipation, this letting go, this freeing oneself is uh, obviously at the core of my work. Um, these are some drawings from the last couple of weeks, actually. I just thought I would show them. Um, again, classism. I love Russian literature. It's so Leo Tolstoy and... Uh, Actually, Alfred Tennyson, the British poet. But um, yeah, memories breaking, letting go. Um, the real recent piece. We're at 24 minutes, so I'm like, I think I'm supposed to wrap this up. Is that right? Go to the Q&A anytime. Yeah, OK, so you get the gist. Ta-da! Um, <laughs> all right.